As it stands, the critical period hypothesis is like a mythical hydra whose multiplicity of heads and capacity to produce new heads rendered it impossible to deal with. Nor does the option of rendering the various versions of the CPH to a single summary form get us very much further. Such a summary would look something like this. For some reason, the language acquiring capacity or some aspect or aspects thereof is operative only for a maturational period which ends sometime between perinatality and puberty. This is not a hypothesis either. It is at best an extremely vague promissory note. David Singleton, The Critical Period Hypothesis, A Code of Many Colors, 2005. While I sort of agree, it kind of sounds like someone has a Hercules complex. As online language teachers, our students are often adults who want to learn a second language for work, education, or personal interest. It is therefore important that we as teachers understand the limiting factors that might impede our adult students' learning. That's where the critical period hypothesis comes in. This is an old hypothesis that is still being hotly debated in second language acquisition circles. I really picked a can of worms to open for this full episode of this classical ESL series. If I make any mistakes, please let me know in the comments because I'm definitely not an expert on this topic. If you want to skip around, check out the timestamps for each chapter because this is definitely going to be a long one. And just a heads up, I'll probably just splash the citations for these papers across the bottom of the screen and avoid saying the names of all these researchers just because I'm probably going to butcher some of them and it's just a bit easier for listening. I'll include a full work cited of everything I read while producing this video. But let's start from the beginning. In a 1956 paper, Penfield and Roberts were looking at children and adults' recovery from damage from injuries to the areas in the dominant hemisphere of the brain used for language processing. They inferred that children transferred language to the non-dominant hemisphere more quickly and with better outcomes than adults. Thus, they must have more neuroplasticity, which then tapers off as the brain matures with the closing of the critical period at age 9. Lennonberg's 1967 work predicted that puberty was the cutoff for native-like language acquisition. Much of that early research was based on biological observations of birds learning to sing and feral children and victims of childhood neglect. As a result, these early theories have been rejected as they do not truly represent or reflect typical linguistic development. The debate has gone back and forth for decades and evolved from an absolute critical period towards more of a younger equals better in the long run in most cases sort of statement on language acquisition. And I have accepted this version of this theory pretty much as gospel, mostly because it's what I learned in Linguistics 106 way back in 2005, and I haven't taken much time to investigate it further, and it just seemed logical to me. It turns out that many linguists disagree with this. There's a lot of debate about the extension of the critical period hypothesis to second language acquisition and to foreign language acquisition, beyond just the question of when the critical period might end. More recent research examines the critical period hypothesis to determine if we're truly seeing age effects in learners past the critical period, or if there are multiple explanatory factors for non-native-like acquisition of an L2. It is really, really hard to make a definitive statement because there are so many different variants of the CPH. One thing most researchers agree on, though, is that most people who start learning their L2 during childhood tend to have better outcomes than people who begin learning as adults, with some exceptional cases. The overarching factor is that these successful young learners need abundant, high-quality input in order to attain native-like use of L2. The real question is why do we see this trend? So now I'll list some of the main questions up for debate related to the CPH. Bear with me. Number one, how do we know that the difference between childhood language acquisition and adult language learning is actually related to biological age? Number two, is it about neurons and physiology of the brain? Number three, do younger learners simply have more time and sort of a head start to ultimately achieve higher proficiency in L2? Number four, how do we rate acquisition and learning success? People throw around terms like native, near native, and non-perceivable non-nativeness, but how do we really define these things in a way that can be used in research? Number five, 
Should we focus on ultimate attainment or learning rate? Are these metrics related and how? Number six, are older learners burdened with a higher effective filter and thus less inclined to experiment and learn from errors? Number seven, do older learners have fewer opportunities to learn from native speaker input and suffer from less time and interest to devote to language learning due to adult responsibilities like work and child rearing and other things that might draw their attention away from education? Number eight, if age really is the most critical factor, what is the cutoff when language learning ability begins to decline? Is it a gradual decline or a sharp drop off? Does the decline continue with age or is there a floor that once reached represents the lifelong low point of learning potential? Many researchers are looking into the answers to these questions and there are probably more questions out there, but I just give you this long list to show you the things that we don't know. And to go along with that, not only do we have many questions to test, it's also incredibly difficult to test it. So here's another list. This time we're enumerating reasons that the critical period hypothesis is difficult to test. Number one, sample sets are often limited to immigrants. A few studies have targeted formal classroom students, but independent adult learners and people older than university age students like our italki students are being left out completely. So is there a difference between the CPH in L1 acquisition versus second language acquisition versus foreign language acquisition? How can those sample sets be compared? Number two, sample sets for oral language skills are often limited in size and scope compared to data sets that can be collected by written or digital surveys. For me, a study with a sample set under 100 doesn't seem very comprehensive. What is the threshold for reliability in terms of sample size? Number three, what are we really testing when we talk about native speaker qualities? Are we looking at syntax, phonetics, phonology, or other things like across the board nativeness, which is something we hear thrown around, but I don't know how that's really being defined. Number four, expecting judges to rank a speaker's pronunciation on a scale of accentedness seems inherently subjective. Syntax is more objective, but also not really what is usually in question when we talk about CPH. Number five, language learning is highly dependent on immeasurable levels of input, motivation, natural ability, etc. Does the existence of exceptional cases where learners excel under ideal circumstances stretch the scale, or should we plot these individuals as outliers? Number six, if we believe that general cognitive abilities and quality and quantity of input, i.e. like compensatory factors, are important, then how do we effectively and reliably control for those factors? Number seven, age of language learning onset is not always self-reportable. Immigrants may not have immediate or meaningful exposure to L2 due to the family and neighborhood use of L1, Researchers have some methods for trying to handle this data, but it seems like a really difficult metric to account for and it might skew results. So this inventory of questions and testing pitfalls probably just scratches the surface of the topic. That's just kind of where I am after weeks of reading and research. Obviously, I couldn't begin to discuss all these questions or adequately expose all the literature behind these concepts in a single video and I don't understand the math on most of it. But thankfully, that is not the goal of this experience for me. My interest lies in kind of picking out some actionable information that can improve the way I communicate with my students about their learning goals and potential. The most important takeaway for me is that basically all of the papers I read point to the improbability of a non-immersion foreign language learner achieving across the board native likeness. It's not impossible, but the amount and quality of input, level of motivation, and time to devote to explicit study is just out of reach for most learners. And this is not far off from what non-specialists might guess about language learning. For example, my husband told me that I could study his native language for 100 years and never uncover all the intricacies of their idioms. And I don't think he's wrong. 
So we can tell our students that if learning every detail of syntax and having no trace of a foreign accent is their goal or knowing all of the words, then they're just setting themselves up for disappointment and frustration in language learning. With that said, let's dig into some of the helpful stuff that I read. I found two recent studies that contain some insights that are pertinent to online foreign language teaching. You can find the citations for these studies along with a dozen or so other articles that I read down in the description. So the first relevant study I'm going to mention is about syntax acquisition in relation to age. I think this study is really interesting because the breadth and depth of the sample size is kind of amazing. The original population surveyed included more than 600,000 participants, and a follow-up study brought the total up to around a million. And they include speakers accounting for 38 different languages that were represented by at least 1,000 native speakers, and other languages with smaller sample sizes. Wow. The researchers used a dialect quiz that was shared on social media. The focus is purely on syntax and the testing method relies on the recognition of native-like structures rather than the actual production of these syntax features. I tested it out myself and it accurately predicted that I'm a native speaker of American English. It was kind of cool. Despite the limited scope of syntax only through indirect, discrete questions, I think we can still glean some useful information for online foreign language teaching. The data strongly points to a critical period in the late teens, about 17, 17 and a half years old. And the author suggested that native speakers don't reach the asymptote. I think this is a fancy math term to kind of talk about like a language performance ceiling. Anyway, native speakers don't reach this point in their L1 until they're around 30 years old, although most language acquisition takes place in the first 10 to 20 years of life. So what I take that to mean is that our linguistic abilities in our L1 are still developing well into adulthood. So why would we assume that there is a physical or physiological barrier to developing native-like syntactic capabilities in L2 if immersion learning is undertaken before the critical period and is given lots of time to flourish, like decades maybe. It's important to note the distinction made between immersion and non-immersion learning here. They said, I quote, both traditional ultimate attainment analyses and permutation analyses indicated that learners must start by 10 to 12 years of age to reach native like proficiency. Those who begin later run out of time before the sharp drop in learning rate around 17 to 18 years of age. For non-immersion learners, the ceiling was lower, but the overall story was the same. Little difference between learners who start within the first decade of life, with a ceiling that noticeably drops for later learners. These findings are consistent with the protracted trajectory of learning that we observe in our data. Here's another quote from their discussion that I thought was really interesting. In addition to providing the first empirical estimate of how language learning ability changes with age, we address two related issues. First, we found that native and non-native learners both require about 30 years to reach asymptotic performance, at least in immersion settings. While this question has not been previously addressed, these findings are compatible with what is known about the initial period of learning. Second, we found that ultimate attainment, that is, the level of asymptotic performance, is fairly consistent for learners who begin prior to 10 or 12 years of age. We found no evidence that the ultimate attainment curve reaches a floor at or around puberty, as has been previously proposed, like in Johnson and Newport, 1989. So there's a lot of math in this one, but I think it's really interesting. And my impression after reading this article and stumbling over all that math in the methods section is that it takes about 30 years for native and non-native speakers to reach the ceiling for syntax learning, given that they are in an immersive environment. So how does this really relate to what we do as online foreign language teachers? I think that we should tell our students that they can attain perfect grammar. If they include the target language in virtually every aspect of their lives through routine usage and rich input, and they keep it up for about three decades. It's not asking for a lot, right? 
I think it does kind of give hope, though, that it's possible to perfect your language learning. This study is just about syntax, though. So let's pause for a brief personal aside about me. I began learning French at the age of 16, which is arguably too late according to this study and others. But through intensive, explicit learning, I attained a level that was good enough for me to teach the language at a beginner to intermediate level, which in turn led to an improvement in my own skills. Then I lived in the French West Indies from the age of 28 to 30, and now I live in France and I moved here when I was 32 and now I'm 35. It has been a really circuitous way to learn a language, but finally living in France and communicating with people here hasn't been terribly difficult. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but I understand basically everything that I read. My writing is passable, better than passable. However, the thing that betrays me as a non-native while speaking isn't my syntax or my vocabulary. It's my pronunciation. So that leads us to the phonological and phonetic component of the CPH. I stumbled across a very interesting study conducted through the evaluation of 318 Chinese university students in an EFL context. The sample size isn't as huge as the one in the study I was just discussing a moment ago, but the format of this study seems sound and really relevant to what we do as online teachers. So to break it down a little bit, some of the participants were first year English and non-English majors, and some were third year English majors. They participated in receptive and productive phonological assessments, as well as personality tests, and self-rating on things like musical ability and singing, introversion versus extroversion, etc. The age of English learning onset ranged from age 3 to 14, although most schools in China began mandatory English lessons starting in the third grade, so age 8 or 9. The most important part of this questionnaire proved to be the section where students rated their own English pronunciation, referred to as English pronunciation self-concept. EPSC is basically part of what is sometimes called the effective filter and is an amalgamation of how a student feels when speaking, how the learner compares their own ability with their peers, and how the learner perceives evaluations from significant others, not boyfriends or girlfriends. In this case, we're talking about teachers and classmates. In this study, EPSC was correlated with significantly more variance in the phonological performance than factors related to age of learning onset and frequency and quality of input. Beyond the implications for EFL in primary schools, there is a relevant point for all language teachers that confidence is key. We already knew that effective filter is an important factor, but doing more to boost a learner's confidence and self-esteem or self-concept could actually improve their phonological production, not just make them more receptive to learning and attempting utterances. But how do we do that? The authors suggested that teachers should praise learners and identify students who need more support and provide outreach for them. In this way, intervention can lead to improved performance, which will lead to an improved self-concept, and then naturally even better phonological performance. They also mention the value of peer tutors as a way to provide solidarity and team learning. So this is a little bit more complicated in a private tutoring setting, but we as teachers and tutors are uniquely placed to provide a lot of encouragement from a place of authority. I think we can go a step beyond just praising students when they've done something well. I think we should also pay attention to approaches like the compliment sandwich. When we give evaluations of pronunciation, especially at key moments like at the end of a lesson, we can mention a sound or a word that the student pronounced very well, perfectly, and then correct a repeated error that we noted, and then finish by saying another thing that the student did well consistently. This leaves the student with motivation to work on the error without forgetting all the things that they actually did correctly. Personally, I've noticed that I tend to praise my young learners a lot more than I do with my adult learners. Sometimes I just feel awkward saying things like, great job, oh yeah, you did it. You know, I, 
I say those things to kids and it's natural and the kid thrives on that. But I feel like with adults, I don't want to infantilize them. And also I think about how I would feel if somebody was praising me like that. And I just, I don't know. Sometimes it feels like I'm talking down to the student. I think it's important that we as teachers can think of ways to praise our adult learners in ways that don't seem fake, right? In ways that seem really genuine. There are ways to give general praise, though. I think that it would be great if we could say things like, I understood every word, or you spoke very clearly today. These are targeted and truthful statements that aren't directed at the student as a person, but more at their performance. That's what adult learners want to be praised for. I think that these targeted compliments can go a long way to reinforcing a positive self-concept. There were a couple of papers that mentioned explicitly teaching pronunciation versus expecting learners to implicitly pick up the sounds through experience. I feel like there are varying viewpoints on this, especially in the online private tutoring community. So please tell me in the comments how you personally approach teaching pronunciation. Do you use structured activities and drills? Or do you just correct pronunciation here and there? I have a student who lives in an English immersive environment and already speaks English very fluently. He expressed to me that he wants to improve his pronunciation to sound less foreign. However, he's very resistant when I try to incorporate short pronunciation exercises into our conversation lessons. He always says that he prefers to just pick up the sounds and stress patterns through exposure and listening. But what do I do as a teacher when that clearly hasn't been working? And I know that because the student is now coming to me for help. It's kind of hard to balance what he thinks he wants to do with what I think he needs to do to improve. When I was a French as a foreign language pedagogy student in like 2010, 2011, I learned to use the communicative language teaching method, CLT. And our language program coordinator emphasized that although we want to keep things authentic, it is still important to teach pronunciation explicitly, especially in French, where it's one of the most difficult features for students to pick up. But now in my research on CPH, I found out that CLT in its purest form doesn't necessarily advocate explicit pronunciation instruction. CLT prefers to target a phonetic or phonological aspect of a language by presenting examples in an authentic format and use that as an opportunity to lead the learners to practice that aspect. I mean, in theory, this is really nice, but is it always feasible to do this? Uh, personally, I'd say no. I do think that CLT is the best way to teach in general, but that doesn't mean that we can't incorporate some pronunciation drills too. It isn't an all or nothing situation. There is so much more to say on the topic of CPH, but I think this is kind of the stopping point for this video. I may return to this topic at a later date if there's any interest. So here is the bare bones summary of the important takeaways for me. Number one. As Singleton stated in the opening quote for this video, the CPH does not have a unified viewpoint and there are many researchers and studies that present evidence for and against. It's very hard to test and we may never have a definitive answer that everyone agrees on. Number two, second language and foreign language learners may have different ceilings, learning rates, and ultimate attainment for syntax acquisition as opposed to phonetics and phonology. So it's logical to adjust goals according to that and work out what is reasonably possible for an adult learner with a specific amount of time to study and limited exposure to input. Shoot for the moon, but promote reasonable expectations to students. Number three, praise is not to be underestimated as a teaching tool. Adult learners need just as much confidence boosting and positive reinforcement as children. Number four, explicit pronunciation and grammar instruction does have a place in communicative teaching, especially for adult foreign language learners who lack an input-rich immersive environment. Even if CPH is wrong, 
Most adult learners lack the environment and time to devote to interaction, so implicit learning just isn't the best approach for most people. Okay, that's it. The next installment of Classable Scholar is going to have a narrower scope for everyone's sake. Thanks for making it this far if you did. Like, comment, subscribe. Make every class your best class. Bye!